Hello, wrestling fans of the world, and welcome to another edition of your favorite wrestling talk show, Ring Respect Radio, right here on the Video Bros Network, and as well on our new home with Backbreaker Media. My name is Bobby Munson, and I am joined, as always, by the host. He is Papa Smokes, the man with the angelic voice. How are you doing, the Papa Smokes? I'm doing good, Munson, and how are you, all you wrestling people doing out there? I hope everybody's doing well, keeping safe, and having a great time watching some wrestling. And tuning in to our show. If you are tuning in right now for the very first time and you haven't before, we're going to have you go ahead and click the subscribe button down below. Turn on the notification bell so you know anytime we release new material right here on the Video Bros Network. While you're at it, head on over to Backbreaker Media and check us out over there on Twitch, on Podbean, and on also their, also their YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe to all the channels for Backbreaker Media and follow them on all social media as well. As I mentioned, this is a wrestling talk show, and we are here to talk about wrestling. We've got a lot to talk about here today, Papa Smokes. We are going to talk about some of our favorite uh, wrestling as we come along here. But first, we're going to talk about a man, a legend of the wrestling ring, who passed away on us. I believe it was on August 27th due to a bone cancer. And, you know, our love and respect to his entire family at, during this loss and everything like that. We're talking about Bullet Bob Armstrong, Papa Smokes. You know, sad loss for the wrestling world. Yeah, absolutely, Munson. And uh, like we've said before in the past here, it's kind of a shame sometimes that we uh, only get to talk about some of these guys after their passing. But we wanted to uh, uh, celebrate Bob's life and career and uh, and the careers of his family and such like that. So uh, we're going to talk about Bob Armstrong and his career here today. And what a career he had. Uh, he's you know, done it all inside the squared circle as well as been a trainer as well too so a lot of things that we could talk about here with bullet barb armstrong including you know where the bullet name came from in the first place uh looking into the story of this whole thing it was i believe an accident at the gym that started the whole bullet name if i'm not mistaken papa smokes maybe you could fill in a little bit more but i believe he was uh bench pressing uh quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of weight when the bench that he was laying on collapsed underneath of him and the weight fell on his face he needed a lot of different plastic surgeries, which at the time were around the uh, about $35,000 U.S. in cost. So it would take a while for him to be able to get these surgeries done. In the meanwhile, he started to don a mask and call himself The Bullet so that he wasn't uh, being known as Bob Armstrong at the time. And eventually that nickname stuck with him after the mask came off. Yeah, yeah. As I understand it, Munson, I believe he was performing... Uh tricep pullovers with a big dumbbell and uh, that's what fell on his face he, he he nearly lost his entire nose before they uh reattached it so some horrific injuries to his face and a lot of people said he never looked the same after that uh, obviously uh with with thirty five thousand dollars worth of plastic surgery you're not going to look the same after that one but uh he decided to don the mask and uh got the character the bullet going and uh to equal success uh, some fans i think recognized that it was him some did not but still a a strong baby face character and uh and a, then a forever a nickname after that bullet bob armstrong and what a great nickname of course and you know great competitor of the ring uh some of our listeners today uh might not be very familiar with bob armstrong's career what he accomplished inside the squared circle and i know you're the wealth of knowledge around this place here papa spoke so i'm gonna let you Tell the folks a little bit about uh, Bullet Bob Armstrong and what he accomplished in his career. Yeah, sure. Uh, Bob Armstrong, uh, that, that not being his real name, but he was born in 1939 in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, he had a father who was uh, a wrestling fan and used to take him to the matches down in Georgia. And uh, Bob's favorite wrestler was Gorgeous George, you know, back in the 50s there. So uh, uh, obviously a... a, a an extremely famous and influential character was Gorgeous George, and uh, Bob fell in love with the wrestling business uh, early on through Gorgeous George. But he also had other things going on in his life. He was uh, he joined the military and uh, served in Korea. He was a U.S. Marine, so uh, that you know the guy's tough. Then, if you can make it through that training and get uh, situated within a, a wartime area. Uh, he was also a firefighter in Georgia in the early 60s, so a man's man, a, a tough guy already, and uh, into bodybuilding and weight weightlifting and stuff like that. 
Uh, he ended up getting started wrestling in 1960. He was uh, started kind of part time, uh, was a baby face, just wrestling on the local uh, promotions in, in the Georgia and uh, Alabama areas. Uh, worked uh, NWA territories in Florida, uh, Georgia, and Alabama. He uh, and he was popular right off the bat. He uh, he had that look to him that was just kind of one of those inexplicable things. He looked like a, a man's man. He looked like a, a nice dad type character, which is what he was in real life too. And uh, people liked his nice physique. Uh, he uh, he got his his uh, working name Bob Armstrong. He got the name Armstrong from one of the Fuller brothers, uh, another wrestler, who said, "Your name's too boring. Uh, you need a better name because this one's not going to get over." So uh, he got this nice body and these nice arms. How about Armstrong? So that's where that name came from. That's uh, quite a quite a quite a unique way to get a name in the business and stuff like that, and uh, very interesting indeed. Uh, you know, Bullet Barb Armstrong, uh, you know, aside from that part of his career, also, uh, you know, modern day fans might know that he has been inducted into the WWE's Hall of Fame in 2011. Uh, so if you want to get a glimpse of a little bit of that, I'm sure that the WWE Network would have plenty there as well, too. But, you know, there's a lot more research that I believe people can do just going online and going on YouTube, especially. I mean, if you guys are ever wanting to uh, reach out to Papa Smokes and I, Glad to share any information that we have, any uh, matches that we come across and doing our research and stuff like that. Uh, that We spend a lot of our time actually watching classic wrestling and stuff like that to uh, get to be more familiar with what we grew up loving and stuff like that. Uh, you know, but Bullet Barb Armstrong, not just a wrestler, as you said, he also had many other professions outside the ring and inevitably became a uh, wrestling trainer as well, too. Yeah, not a surprise. He he was uh, an excellent technician in the ring. Um, I don't think that, like, I, I always watch some of these old matches kind of thinking or wondering what modern fans or young fans today would think. I, I really don't think his style would have gotten over as a pure baby face today um, just because many things have changed throughout there. Bob never used a gimmick as, aside from the mask uh, as the bullet, but... Um, his his uh, character, so to speak, was just who he was. He was a he was a a, a dad and a, a husband and a father, and he liked to work out a whole bunch. and And he was just a good guy. So audiences took to that. Uh, Bob Armstrong also had the very strong promo skills too, and uh, was was very great on the mic. and And he had a way of bringing the fans into. Uh, to his uh, convictions and his beliefs and his love of wrestling. And uh, the fans just, just uh, bonded with him so closely. And, and uh, he, he was, he was an immediate hit right off the bat as a, what they call a white meat baby face, I suppose, a, a good guy that uh, never cheated or anything like that. And, uh, and he was popular right off the bat, but I, I often wonder if there's, there's not much room for that kind of a character left in wrestling anymore. So many uh, uh, baby face or characters uh, like to kind of walk the line between heel. You know, everybody since uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin wants that kind of a pop to be a little bit of both. And uh, Armstrong just wasn't like that at all. He was uh, he was a wrestler of the people and uh, and of the fans, and they love to love him all the way. And then uh, he went ahead and uh, actually trained, uh, we keep talking about it, being a dad, he trained his four boys to come into the wrestling world as well, too. Uh, some people might be very familiar with a couple, maybe a few of his sons, but I think that maybe we should talk about uh, a few of these guys here and uh, see what we can bring to the fans listening into the show today, Papa Smokes. For sure. Um, his oldest son was named Joe, but in the, his wrestling name was uh, Scott Armstrong. He was a, a moderately successful wrestler, not nearly so much as his dad, but went on to future fame with uh, WWE as a referee and then later as a backstage producer and all that. I think S Scott Armstrong has been uh, refing up until this year, up until COVID time, if I'm not mistaken. I think he might have been one of the people that was furloughed, as they say, uh, when... when uh, 
operations slowed down during the COVID crisis. So, uh, uh, yeah, a, a long career, a, a guy that's in his fifties, uh, probably late fifties now, but it's also a, a healthy workout guy and uh, still working as a ref in the biggest company in the world. And I believe he was actually the referee in the main event, the title match at WrestleMania 25, if I'm not mistaken, as well, too. So a huge highlight for his career as well there. And yes, a very long career that he had with the WWE as well. Like you said, maybe not on the level that his father did as a wrestler, but very respectful as a referee and a producer. Uh, so then uh, moving on from him, uh, let's talk about the next one. Yeah, the next oldest son was named Robert, but his wrestling name was Brad Armstrong. Uh, I think everybody thought he was going to be the one to eclipse his father's success. Uh, I remember uh, as a kid knowing Brad Armstrong as a wrestler before I actually knew uh, the dad, Bob. But uh, Brad had the had the look. He was handsome. He had the great uh, athletic body. He learned wrestling from when he was a young child and was just a, a technic, technical wrestler, a technician, completely smooth, completely fast, completely uh, believable in all aspects of, the, uh, of wrestling. He wasn't as strong on the microphone as his dad. It seemed like, um, he, like he, Brad was another character that, that didn't really have a, a gimmick, so to speak. Uh, he was just... Uh, a guy, he was who he was, Bob's Bob Armstrong's son, but he seemed like he was a little bit uncomfortable on the mic uh, in front of people. Uh, never really was able to give one of those uh, fiery from the heart promos that can make some people's careers. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it's kind of a weird thing too. He never really made it big in the business. Uh, he made it big. He was in WCW and. Uh, I think he might even had a cup of coffee in the WWE as maybe preliminary talent, but with that look and that body, he really should have made it bigger. But uh, he he didn't, and uh, and uh, he was also the one that uh, died young too. I think he was fifty or fifty-two. He was found dead in his home of an apparent heart attack, and uh, the wrestling world was crushed when uh, Brad Armstrong passed away young like that. No one could have possibly suspected that. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he was also named uh, PWI's uh, most underrated talent around 1986 or 87, somewhere around there, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to check my notes again there, Papa Smokes. But yes, PW, uh, PWI actually named him as one of the most underrated wrestling talent in the world at that point in time. And, you know, looking back on uh, what the guy had, the, the kid had to offer at the time, I mean, I see why they would call him that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the future was incredibly bright for him, but uh, it just never really came together. He never had his big moment or his uh, flagship match that everybody thought was great or anything like that. He was a, an excellent worker that, that, that wrestled for his whole life, but uh, he never really made it big. And in fact, uh, this is kind of a little interesting side story I came across here. Uh, Brad Armstrong was a believer in what had maybe kind of started as a joke, but it was called the Armstrong Curse, because uh, I, apparently back in the day, Bob Armstrong had 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 some matches against Abdullah the Butcher, and for whatever reason, maybe as a rib, he stole a shrunken head that Abdullah used to carry around with him as a you know as a scary kind of prop to bring into the ring. And for, yeah, for whatever reason, he stole Abdullah's shrunken head. And uh, whenever some bad stuff had happened to the Armstrongs, they they kind of, uh, especially Brad, uh, uh, chalked it up to the Armstrong curse. And that was one of the reasons he he thought that maybe he never got big was because of the curse. And I mean, obviously, it's a little bit ridiculous or whatever, but it's just one of those little interesting side stories to in wrestling. Uh, to this particular story that I, I found uh, kind of fascinating. Well, speaking of that curse, I believe that uh, you could also look at the uh, way that uh, sometimes they were booked as well, too. The Him and his uh, one brother in WCW, like you mentioned, were in there as a tag team, the Armstrong brothers, and they were generally looked at as being a jobber tag team, usually taking the losses most of the time to the other talent 
on the WCW roster at the time. Until finally, later down the road, they got that one big upset win, went on a little bit of a short run. Company guy that gave them a little bit of a shot in the arm until they went right back to having them down uh, back to the bottom of the card again. But speaking of, that would be the next brother, I believe, that's on our list, if I'm not mistaken, Papa Smokes. Let's uh, move over to him. Well, there is one other brother named Steve that, that did wrestle for a while, but but not even to the at all to the level of the other brothers. Um, so he he had his own thing and, and worked uh, uh, in his own areas outside of wrestling. But the youngest brother I think you're getting at is Brian Gerard uh, or BG BG uh, James is their last name BG James or Brian James, uh, and we all know that he went to uh, uh, he achieved stardom as uh, the Road Dog in WWE during the Degeneration X years and. I mean, quite obvious that he inherited the, the microphone skills and the charisma of his dad, Bob, and uh, made quite a little name for himself in wrestling, at least for a few years there. Like quite the uh, country music singer, if I'm not mistaken, too, from back in the day as well. So, yes, uh, BG James, uh, you know, very ta talented individual, uh, had quite a run for himself. And honestly, I, when we... I uh, proposed the idea of doing the research on this one. Again, I wasn't as familiar with Bob Armstrong, had heard of him. I uh, did not know the connection between all the Armstrongs and that uh, family lineage, all the brothers and stuff, and definitely did not know that Road Dog Jesse James was, in fact, related to or the son of Bob Armstrong. And it really goes to show to the credit of Bob Armstrong and the talent he had in training his sons to become the stars that they were to potentially become. Uh, some of them in different ways than what uh, would have been expected. Some of them didn't, like you said, didn't quite get the opportunity that they, you know, so long deserved. But, you know, he definitely left a legacy, especially through uh, B.G. James, who had a very storied career and a well-known one to the modern-day fans. So, you know, excellent that Bob Armstrong was able to carry out that much great greatness with the uh, lineage of his sons there in professional wrestling. Yeah, yeah, and of course, uh, uh, Brad Armstrong and B.G. James, or Bre uh, Brian James, ended up uh, both working for uh, WWE after they were finished uh, in-ring wrestling, and uh, uh, I do believe Brian still works there. Do you know this for sure, Munson? Uh, I, I believe he does. I think so. I, I haven't kept up with it too much. I know that for a while there... I believe he was on the creative side of either Monday Night Raw or SmackDown, and for quite a while there was a lot of the modern fans are going to remember this. They were quite disappointed and pointing fingers at him in particular for the way things were being booked. Again, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I can't say that it's necessarily BG James or any of these guys that you think that are actually creatively running your Monday Night Raws, your NXTs, your SmackDowns and stuff like that. These guys are being... You know, they're being choked when it comes down to the booking angles and stuff like that. They probably have some great ideas, some stuff that you could throw out there would be excellent, be interesting. People might like it. But again, this is a publicly traded company. This is a company with a certain image to uphold and everything like that. And at the end of the day, there's one man that's calling the shots. And that's Vince McMahon. And whether you like it or not, that's who's making the end decision, not BG James not anybody else that's on that creative team. So again, everybody who ever thought that he was responsible for the bad booking and stuff like that, you're pointing the finger at the wrong person. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that too. And uh, like you say, WWE is a corporation now. It's a publicly traded company and they make most of their uh, income through TV deals. Therefore, the TV product is the most important thing. So what McMahon has been doing for the last... I'm going to say 10 to 12 year kind of period, something roughly about that is his creative is he doesn't have a one man booker like most territories do. One person that makes all the decisions right or wrong, but it's one guy running it so that every decision gets made. Yes or no. Um, he has a, he hires TV writers now. That's what his creative team are. So Aside from a couple people that might still be with creative, such as Bruce Pritchard or uh, Pat Patterson, uh, I think that uh, a lot of the writing is just done by TV writers. They're trying to make a compelling TV show, not just for wrestling fans, but for people that want a, uh, an entertaining TV show to watch. Hence the 
the uh, increased amount of cinematic matches, hence the ridiculous angles that go on for months and months and then some sometimes get resolved and sometimes disappear. And, but uh, yet there are just quite frankly less wrestling people making the big decisions in WWE than there used to be. It used to be all wrestling people making those decisions. Now it's people that aren't really what you would call smart to the business. They're not uh, informed about the backstage uh, manner in which wrestling is run, in which the decisions are made, and, and the fine art of booking, which is an incredibly difficult thing to learn. Uh, uh, you, you don't just pick up a book and read it about uh, booking wrestling matches. You have to have someone teach you how to do it, all the reasons why you can do certain things, why you want to not do other things, and uh, someone that understands the business of wrestling inside and out. And I just think that uh, some of these big companies uh, like WWE and, and AEW have less and less uh, knowledgeable wrestling people in their creative and in their uh, business offices, and therefore... Uh, is sometimes the product doesn't make sense from a wrestling standpoint. You're right on that one, Papa Smokes. And again, we're going to uh, use that as our opportunity to move over into the next section of the show. So again, we just want to say, if you don't uh, have a familiarity with Bob Armstrong and you like what you've heard here today, we definitely suggest go out and check Bob Armstrong out. Check out all the work from his boys as well, too. Great uh, up-and-coming talents that were in the business at one point. But speaking of up-and-coming talents and speaking of companies that maybe do understand the wrestling business, the alternative to WWE is not all WWE wrestling, or AEW as they like to call it. It's something that we like to call Major League Wrestling, MLW, something that Papa Smokes and I are both big fans of and watch quite regularly. MLW is going to be the subject of our next topic here today. We want to talk all about them because... In November, MLW is coming back with brand new wrestling action. For all of us who have been waiting for an opportunity to see some real wrestling action in the modern day, MLW announced just recently they are coming back with the hashtag The Return, coming this November. And you know what? A part of this whole MLW return pop of smokes, there's a lot around it, a lot of things that they're doing in order to uh, make sure that things are in place. And I'm just going to read an excerpt from the MLW website about their plans with COVID-19 in place. So here goes. It states, with plans for Major League Wrestling's restart underway, MLW remains steadfast in making health and safety the number one priority. Several MLW staffers recently underwent training to become certified in COVID-19 protocols. Additionally, MLW has introduced a COVID-19 compliance officer as a member of its team moving forward. The newly designed position is responsible for establishing and enforcing COVID-19 safety protocols, training staff, and monitoring compliance on all sets and venues. The health and welfare of our athletes, crew, and staff is very important, said MLW CEO Court Bauer. This new position will provide the league with insight, strategy, and guidance as we strive to deliver the best practices and safety measures for the restart. The medically certified COVID-19 compliance officer is educated in the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, dis disinfection, social distancing, CDC, local and state guidelines, and other information related to preventing the spread of infection on a film production set. The person is responsible for safety compliance and enforcement of rules. Just like all broadcast productions have a producer or a football team has an offensive coordinator, the COVID-19 compliance is another necessary member of our organization moving forward, said MLW CEO Court Bauer. A great statement here from MLW, especially in these times. A lot of uncertainty has been you know, put out there, especially with uh, guys like WWE, AEW pushing forward with shows with no fans, not maybe necessarily having all the best practices in place. It, it definitely a breath of fresh air to see a company come forth and say, hey, look, we took a step backwards. We decided to come up with a big business plan. Here's what we're going to do. And shit, if they didn't come back with a great plan here, Puff Smokes. Yeah, I got to agree with that. It, it's Isn't it refreshing to hear of a company that's going to... Uh take some care for their uh, staff and performers by uh, uh, not just forging ahead uh, uh, with their plans. I, I mean, I understand that 
the big companies that have TV deals and contracts need to fulfill their their uh, part of the contract for content and such like that. But um, some of these smaller companies, uh, uh, such as MLW and the NWA, are uh, had to press the pause button and uh, and they're losing money. We've all heard that the NWA is basically on life support these days and having some of their talent roster rated by other federations and such. But uh, I, I have a healthy respect for uh, those companies that uh, that uh, took that road to uh, to maintaining the safety of their staff, performers, and fans as well. And uh, I. I could we be seeing a glimpse into the future here for lots of businesses that might have to hire a person, a specialist to that uh, can uh, uh, ensure that anti-COVID protocols are being uh, observed throughout uh, the entire uh, business? Uh, I think this is something that we might see a lot of in the future. It's huge for the PR for MLW, for sure, especially when you're coming back after all this time. You want to come back and make an impact, and that's what they're definitely planning to do. I uh, also had read that the uh, feel of the show is going to be a little bit different moving forward, that they've got a uh, look that they're going for so that it doesn't, you know, show that this is an empty crowd and stuff like that. I don't know if there's going to be some seats filled or whatever, but the general feel and look to it is going to make it feel like you're watching something worth watching kind of thing, not just an empty arena matchup, which, you know, we've talked about on the show many times before. But, you know, one thing the fans might not be familiar with is maybe just the road MLW has had in order to get to where they are today, Paul Smokes. I, I had to do a little digging myself. I'll be the first to admit MLW for me has become something I've become interested in and started watching in the past, you know, year to two years kind of thing uh, that I started catching up on. I knew of their existence before. I'm not going to lie to you. I heard about them in the early 2000s, just never really had the resources at the time to check out their material. Now, gone back and had a look at it, especially now that they've started releasing some of the MLW Underground footage, which we'll get back to in a second here. It looks like this company has been around for a while. I mean, they're just not a go-away company that's coming, you know, shown up in the last year or two. This is a company that started in 2002. Uh, Court Bauer, I believe, was a writer for the WWE at the time, and when he left, he wanted to create a new company that focused on the hardcore style of wrestling that the, you know, was going by the wayside that ECW wasn't allowed to do anymore or anything like that. And a lot of that uh, former ECW talent actually came over and helped uh, MLW kind of kickstart their their whole show in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I don't think the timing of uh, Bauer's decision to start a, a new federation is any coincidence. Uh, McMahon had already purchased WCW and ECW in 2001, which... Uh, which eliminated most of his competition, right, on a on a on a certain level, and uh, Bauer was just, uh, I think, smart to try and uh, fill in the void a little bit that was left by the purchase of those two companies. Start a new one. Uh, there, he knew that there would be some extra talent floating around that uh, wouldn't be in WWE, so he started the started uh, MLW up in Philadelphia in two thousand two, and and moved down to Florida, but it really didn't take off that first time, did it? No, it didn't. In fact, they were uh, shut down in 2004, I believe. This was shortly after they had the uh, TV deal, having some of the MLW Underground uh, television show actually hit the air. Uh, that show ran, I believe, for about uh, several months or something like that before the uh, deal ended, and then the uh, company essentially folded at the time. And then more recently, they have come back I believe it was 2017 that they announced that new shows were going to occur. 2018, when they struck the deal with BN Sports in order to start uh, showing MLW Fusion, which now had what I find to be a more interesting, more focused idea of saying, we're a show that provides fans with a little bit of everything from all styles of wrestling. They bring you strong style. They bring you lucha wrestling. They bring you you know, everything from all around the world kind of thing. There's, you know, hardcore wrestling there. You know, there's something for everybody, essentially, on MLW. But one of the main things I really like about MLW is they've got storylines that matter. They've got, you know, up-and-comers that are just absolutely phenomenal. And they make you want to actually tune in to each and every program that you can you can catch on either BN Sports. Uh, they've now also opened it up to YouTube. And 
I believe just recently also struck a t uh, deal with uh, the application uh, Dazen, or Dazen, I believe it's pronounced. So Fusion can actually be seen on many different channels around the world. And really, I mean, this is something people need to be tuning into. And I think I'm going uh, to hold hand the reins over to you, Pop. Supposed to talk a little bit more about this. Let's just talk about what's great about MLW and what uh, guys over there are making it worth tuning into. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with what you were saying before about uh, that's what attracted me to the show initially is that it has a, a really international feel. Uh, Bauer has got that working relationship with uh, Lucha Libre AAA, AAA out of Mexico City. So they've been doing shows uh, and trading talent. Uh, uh, they've been doing shows in Mexico trading talent with the luchadors and such. Uh, they also have, uh, they've got a new working agreement with Pro Wrestling Noah, which is a Japanese company. They're getting something going just this year with uh, Dragon Gate in Japan as well. So that keeps it fresh for the viewer, I think, when, when uh, talent is being traded. We get to see some up and coming stars that maybe we've never heard of from different countries, such as Mexico, such as Japan. Um, he's trying to get uh, TV deals in the UK. And I even read something where uh, Bauer's trying to get a TV deal for some uh, countries in Africa as well, which is like, you know, is seemingly uh, unplumbed territory for uh, uh, wrestling on TV to be shown. So I, I kind of admire Bauer and uh, he's he's got a big international vision for his company. And I, I, it, it sounds like it would be very expensive, but... Uh, you know, really, it's the viewer that ends up winning out because you get a, you get fresh talent coming in all the time. You get international talent. We all know as wrestling fans that some of the best new shit comes out of Japan and Mexico, and including wrestlers and moves and sequences and styles and such. So, uh, yeah, for me, it was always fresh. It wasn't the same roster uh, interchangeably fighting the same roster kind of thing. You you got some new talent, you got some fresh faces, and that always made it uh, a pleasure for me to watch. And talk about some of these fresh faces. Uh, some of our listeners are going to be very familiar with some names that we can mention right now because you've become big fans of some of these people as they've debuted <clears throat> in All Elite Wrestling AEW. I mean, we could talk right off the hop about the biggest star to come out of MLW yet. We're talking about... MJF. I mean, this guy was, you know, top dog over in MLW. Uh, he ran the gauntlet there, uh, did really well for himself, and as soon as AEW signed him, it was obvious to me, because I had seen so much of his work already, this guy was going straight to the top of that company and to the wrestling world in general. Yeah, uh, MJF was a member of the faction known as the Dynasty in MLW. They're a uh, uh, it was Alexander Hammerstone, MJF, and Richard Holiday as as kind of some rich uh, jerks kind of thing, uh, kind of like uh, frat boys, but growing up into wrestlers and such, and uh, uh, a heel faction. And uh, uh, there are a few good factions in this uh, company that could also have wrestlers that make the jump to bigger companies, except that I also think Bauer is a smart promoter in the way that he started offering uh, multi-year contracts to his to his workers in order to keep them. We heard recently that Alexander Hammerstone signed a three-year deal for some decent money. We also uh, heard that Jacob Fatu, the, the MLW heavyweight champion, who is a guy who could be who could be a main guy in any of these uh, big companies on TV for sure. He's part of that Anoa'i family and uh, he's intensely talented, but Bauer locked him up into a good deal in uh, MLW and, and it, it really seems like some of the wrestlers like working there and don't, uh, don't want to make the jump to other companies. They, they like it there partly for some of the reasons we've just been extrapolating on that they, they get to face different talent. They get to face uh, wrestlers that they admire from different countries. They get to do the traveling and, and they get some freedom in, in the choices they can make about their character and in the ring too. So 
I think uh, Bauer uh, signing guys to uh, contracts is a great idea as well. Again, yeah, and a lot of people might think of that as, you know, you're locking somebody up, not giving them the freedom to go anywhere, but these contracts don't necessarily work the same as they do in, say, a, a WWE or something where the contract's exclusive WWE. Again, with these working relationships that you talk about with, uh, Dragon Gate, Pro Wrestling, no uh, uh, AAA down in Mexico and stuff like that. It's still giving a lot of freedom and opportunity for these wrestlers to go be seen in front of many different crowds, many different audiences, and an opportunity to make some, you know, really good coin on the independent circuit at the same time while getting that TV exposure to the all the channels that MLW has opened up for its stars already. Uh, you know, we mentioned it, uh, MJF going over to AEW, but man, what a great time to lock up a couple guys like you mentioned and Jacob fought too and Alexander Hammerstone because those are two guys, I swear, it's surprising to me that there hasn't been big money dropped their way from either WWE or AEW. If, again, maybe it has been and these guys just strictly turned it down and wanted to work for MLW and Kurt Court Bauer has offered them enough to stick there. But Jacob Fatu, Alexander Hammerstone, I mean, they're only two of many on the roster that I feel are going to be big names in this business moving forward. Yeah, and I think you make a good point there too that, that that I should have made also is that they're not exclusive contracts. These guys are still independent contractors, a little bit more than uh, independent than the independent contractors in WWE who have no choice but to stay there. But uh, um, yeah, we've uh, as an example, we've recently seen Brian Pillman Jr. doing some matches in AEW, but. He's an MLW guy. He's going to stay there. He has a contract. And uh, same as uh, Davy Boy Smith Jr. too. And another guy who could uh, who could probably pick and choose where he wrestles. And he picks and chooses to stay in MLW, which is, which is impressive. And it also speaks to that it must be a good locker room. And it must be a good work environment. And uh, they've got a lot of good stars. Uh, how about... Uh, Kevin Von Erich's sons, uh, Ross and Marshall Von Erich, uh, really good-looking young wrestlers that could uh, that could be a, a hit tag team in in any federation, really. But uh, those guys, uh, under the guidance of uh, the great Kevin Von Erich, their dad, uh, decided to uh, go with MLW, and they they're getting a good push. They've got tag team gold there, and uh, yeah, there's obviously something good. Uh, in the locker room too for these guys that make them want to stay and how much of a great thing was that for us uh old school fans that they won their tag team gold in a texas tornado matchup i mean there's only a certain handful of fans listening right now that might actually understand the joy of that what was behind that but you know being that you know a family member of theirs worked for the wwe under the name the texas tornado it's just fitting that these two guys pick up their first tag team gold in a texas tornado matchup fantastic idea fantastic old school style thing for court bauer to book fantastic great to see the von erics involved in pro wrestling and again considering the name that comes with that family you i'm very surprised that these aren't guys that are being looked at from some of the bigger companies if again they have the you other know, like we keep saying maybe they have been and mlw is just that great of a locker room to work for that they're not interested they've got what they want they're doing what they like to do they're not being buried in behind a you know a useless tag division on television somewhere else right now so they're being made to look like the stars that they deserve to be made to look like, like any Von Eric should have ever been made to look like. Yeah, that's absolutely true too. And uh, I think uh, along with some of these uh, young guys that Bauer and MLW are bringing up, they're, they're scouting some of their own uh, young talent to bring in, which is of course uh, uh, necessary for every wrestling company to survive. But He's also smart in, in having some veterans around, too. He's got Loki as a wrestler there who uh, has a bit of a salty past in wrestling, but uh, I think is a little more mellow now and is teaching some of the guys in the locker room uh, uh, the, the ways of the wrestling world as well. He's got Conan, who's doing his uh, uh, negotiations in Mexico, and uh, he's got Savio Vega, too, who has a as a road agent or a producer and, and Savio Vega has the connections in the Caribbean and in Puerto Rico 
So there, uh, they have that side of it too, which just uh, furthers the kind of international flavor of the company, but also uh, having some veterans in some key positions there too to help bring up the young guys, to help uh, everybody so that their their ring work is good, their microphone work is good, their matches are being agented uh, very well, and uh, I just think it's a great idea to to get a couple of established veterans in there just to help out. And it's not just the wrestling talent that's involved there that's uh, really good as well, too. And, I mean, I'm going to probably get corrected on this name as well, too. I believe her uh, last name goes by De La Renta, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I forget the first name, but, man, is she marvelous on a microphone. Selena De La Renta. There we go. Yeah, yeah they have, they've been using her as kind of an authority figure, GM sometimes, but she's also uh, kind of like a manager of factions sometimes and very young lady 20 early 20s 22 or something like that but uh marvelous on the microphone a very beautiful young lady as well uh, and just she gets wrestling she's she's she does an excellent job in her position and uh she's also been doing uh she's been producing and directing episodes of fusion as well at, at that young age so they they've got a real blue chip stock right there in selena de la renta too and they've also, you met, you've mentioned about some of the experienced guys there as well, too. And I did think uh, being that we're from Canada, it would be uh, hard for us not to mention that Teddy Hart is at his share of matchups at, at the top of the card for MLW as well, too. And, I mean, I, I like to say experienced because Teddy Hart himself has been around a lot longer than I'm sure a lot of the uh, fans listening right now would understand. And, again, like not locked down to anything with MLW because... We've seen uh, Teddy Hart actually up here in Canada, especially here in Western Canada, for some absolutely uh, mind-blowing matchups that he's had with some of the roster uh, guys who we're familiar with up in our end here. Yeah, yeah, Teddy Hart, I'm not sure if he's uh, active as a wrestler at this time. He's got some stuff going on in his personal life, I think, but um, he was part of the uh, Hart, new Hart Foundation uh, faction with Brian Pillman Jr. and Davey Boy Smith Jr., so... Just a, a, another neat faction that uh, that uh, brings the past and makes it new again. There was another thing I liked that uh, MLW did last year. Speaking of making the old new again, did did you ever watch the Opera Cup? They had that um, uh, tournament, and they, uh, what happened was, I guess uh, Davy Boy Smith Jr. found an old trophy in, in the, the old Hart Mansion, and it's called the Opera Cup. And I guess it used to be a, a, a real tournament held every year in New York uh, where some federation held their uh, shows in, a, in an opera house. So they ended up calling it the Opera Cup. So anyway, Davy Boy Smith Jr. finds this statue that, uh, that Stu had from the old days in the place and he he brought it to MLW and said hey guys you think we could use this and uh, obviously Bauer and the writer said hell yeah let's let's start it up again so that's going to be a yearly thing now too and I believe uh, Davy Boy Smith Jr. won it this past year which is quite fitting but uh, they're going to have the Opera Cup as one of their sort of pay-per-views now and it just tickles me to to find out uh, about an old tournament I never knew about before, and the guys are going to bring it back and uh, make it new again. And I think that's one of the best parts about MLW. I mean, we can praise the talent, we can praise the booking and stuff like that, but I think it's the, the freedom for them to understand that, you know, they can go out there and book everything that they want to book and stuff like that, but when somebody comes to you and presents an idea, that's a good idea, you don't just immediately shoot it down because it didn't come from your TV writers, it didn't come from, you know, the guy running the company or anything like this. They're taking on board these ideas from wrestlers and really trying to, you know, bring back a little bit of the feel of some of the old school stuff with the modern day wrestling style at the same time we're talking about like yeah the opera cup it comes in here's an idea hey this has a lot of lineage behind it that used to exist it you know goes back to the days of Stu hart who again i should mention was mentioned on our previous episode of ring respect radio so go back i'll put a, a little uh, link here for people to go check out last uh, time's episode but yes i mean Stu hart had this trophy kicking around davy boy smith jr hey i've got this great idea why don't we bring this back and mlw says hell yeah Let's do this. It sounds like a great idea. I'm excited. I mean, yeah, it was great 
seeing the first one. I'm excited to see this as a yearly thing. What a great tournament style thing that we can bring into professional wrestling and a great major pay-per-view for you know the guys at MLW to be able to present each and every year. And there's a good possibility too that that's one of the reasons these guys like working there because maybe sometimes if you come up with an idea they'll actually listen to you and actually consider it or actually enact that idea unlike some other companies who I'm sure would not listen to your idea at all. And it seems like the, the, the nice thing about MLW is you go back and look at who has won their championships. It uh, doesn't matter what championship it is. You're not seeing a long list of 50 different champions. Every guy who walks in the business needs to be, have a title around his damn waist. They understand champions are champions. Job guys are job guys. They go out there to do the job that they're going to do. And the guys who are champions are made to look like proper champions because they're built strong. They look strong. And they make you believe that this is a guy that belongs at the absolute top of the MLW card. Of course, they're always trying to bring up new guys, bring up new faces. But you know what? They damn well have to earn it, Papa Smokes, if they're ever going to be in that title picture. And if they're ever going to carry this company on their shoulders. Yeah, and that just only adds prestige to your belts when, when they're not handed around uh, so often. When uh, people that hold them are holding on to them for a year, a year and a half, two years. That uh, rings back to the old days of wrestling, too, where uh, title runs would uh, would go a, a year, two years, three years, and uh, it made the belt more prestigious because the champion was fighting to not lose that title and, and touring around with it and facing such a different, uh, different roster of opponents all the time. I, I think it... In some other companies, the belts are, are, are don't have any prestige left to them. They're just ornaments. But the MLW kind of sticking to the old formula of the champion is the best guy in your company and kind of vying to be the best guy in the business as a whole. So it just adds prestige to uh, each belt and each championship. I wholeheartedly agree. Now, we could probably go on all night here about MLW, how much we love it and stuff like that. I mean, I urge people to go check it out, especially with the return coming up, to check out what they're going to do moving forward. Papa Smokes, do you have anything else you want to cover with MLW here today? Yeah, maybe just one more thing that I just like about MLW is that uh, they uh, have an interest in other combat sports as well. So we, Hence, we have Filthy Tom Lawler, a former UFC fighter, uh, as uh, one of the combatants in MLW, he he's building his faction, uh, Team Filthy. He's got Dominic Garini, the uh, the Italian uh, jiu-jitsu expert. He's got King Mo, who of course is a famous MMA fighter. And I always think that adds legitimacy to a professional wrestling company when they not only acknowledge other combat sports, but embrace that and... Uh, it brings uh, an element of realness into your company and uh, uh, some grit and some fire as well. And uh, I just think uh, Bauer's doing a great, great job as a promoter and uh, and CEO of his company. And uh, yeah, I'm totally down for MLW. Can't wait till the restart in November. And uh, anyone that's listening out there, at least check it out. It's a pretty good show, and I think you guys might like it. I completely agree. Yes, go check out MLW, available on YouTube, again, on Dazen and on BN Sports. Uh, wherever you can find them, check them out. Uh, they've also got their underground shows that came from early stages of the company, where you can see uh, guys who went on to be stars like CM Punk even uh, getting their start in the wrestling business. So definitely, if you're a wrestling fan of modern-day wrestling, go and check out MLW. And if you're a fan of old-school wrestling and you've been looking for something to the alternative you're finding on your weekly programming, on television then we swear by it mlw is the answer to the modern day wrestling situation but that is how we're going to wrap up the show here today it's been wonderful talking about bob armstrong and his legacy as well as talking about major league wrestling and their restart that's coming up as well too we hope you've enjoyed this edition of ring respect radio here on the video bros network as well as on backbreaker media we want to thank you very much for tuning in once again to the show and we look forward to hearing again with or talking to you again here in the near future thank you once again everybody and have a great night